Good, uh, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the British Library and welcome to the Long Player Conversation 2017. Um, my name is Roly Keating. I'm Chief Exec here at the BL. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I'm sure I know many of you are members. You've all got a sense of the collections of the British Library. But even those who know and love this place aren't always aware that we are also the home of the National Sound Archive. Um, some six and a half million recordings growing all the time, of course, in almost every conceivable and imaginable format. And wonderful as this collection is, it is in fact at risk, uh, because if you know anything about technology, technology fades, it fails, the carriers fade, the actual technologies so we are just at the beginning of one, for those of you who care about audio and sound, which of course is one of the great themes we're going to be touching this evening, um, we are just at the beginning of a campaign we call Save Our Sounds to digitise and preserve as much of the nation's sound heritage as we can before time takes its toll and this extraordinary legacy of recordings, whether it's music or conversation or accent or nature, uh, disappears um, from, uh, from the national heritage. And we have 10 partners across the UK, uh, wonderful generosity of the Heritage Lottery Fund to support that. Uh, and it's not just about preservation, it's about thinking about the future of how an institution like this collects and preserves new sound, the radio that's broadcast, the oral history uh, that is the true memory of a society, and, of course, the future sounds of the natural world as well. So as part of this, we are, uh, um, as ever at the British Library, creating a programme of events. Tonight's event is part of what we're calling our Season of Sound, uh, six months of all sorts of things happening in and across and around the library, including I hope some of you have been to visit Listen in the main hall, which is the wonderful free exhibition celebrating 140 years of recorded sound. Uh, and then when it came to think about talks and conversations, of course we found ourselves naturally drawn to our friends at the Long Player Trust uh, and you'll hear more about this in a moment, but those who look after and celebrate a, an extraordinary work of art, which I first encountered when it began around the turn of this century, Long Player, uh, by Jem Finer. And uh, each year, Long Player hosts a conversation. Just to say, because there'll be a proper introduction in a moment, uh, I'm particularly thrilled uh, that we are hosting tonight's incarnation of Long Player's Conversation. Um, natural and environmental sounds are one of the great, great glories of the British Library's sound collection. Um, we've been collecting uh, this heritage for many, many decades and continue to do so, and there is no one better than Chris Watson to talk about that and explore the issues it raises uh, and the techniques used to capture the... Um, the audio memory of the world beyond the, human, uh, beyond the human on this planet. And then our other interlocutor tonight, uh, you will know from for many, many uh, parts of his extraordinary career, but I just want to say that, of course, and, and I've known David off, on and off for many years, when we first launched and even conceived of launching our campaign to save our sounds, um, David... Attenborough was, with typical generosity, one of the very, very first to step forward to help promote it. Uh, so we're extremely grateful both to David uh, and to Chris that they've come here tonight. But to introduce uh, the context and the background and our special guests, please can I hand to the chair of the Long Player Trust, Gareth Evans. So welcome, Gareth. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Roly, uh, for your kind comments and for setting the scene. Uh, all your comments I absolutely agree with and endorse. Many thanks to John Fawcett, to Anna, Susanna, everyone here at the British Library, of course, for making this event possible. And similarly to everyone at the Long Player Trust, the trustees, to especially to Michael Morris, to Sarah Davies, and of course to the composer uh, of Long Player, Jem Finer. Um, as Roly says, it's wonderful for the Long Player Conversation 2017 to be here for a number of reasons, of course, not least because it's part of the season of sound and because the idea of the library itself 
itself, uh, its relationship to time, to the preserving of the past for its presentation in the present for the future, is absolutely in keeping with Long, Long Player's own mission. It's about an archive of time, of course, and of world knowledge for the future and about its presentation. And I hope that Long Player has all those elements uh, in the mix, which I'll come to shortly. It's also about precision, of course, and classification. Um, without proper classification, a library is nothing. Of course, if you put a book back on the wrong shelf, it could be gone forever. Um, but that precision should open up conversation rather than close it down in a reductive way. And, of course, the idea of classification classification, overlaps between the bookshelves and all forms of archiving and the natural world. So precise, of course, is the uh, library's own classification system that the green room that we've been enjoying the pleasures of before coming on stage is actually green, which is important <laughs> because it's not always the case. Green rooms can come in a whole range of colours, tones and hues, but the, the green room, as you'd expect, is green. You were listening to Long Player um, as, it, as you came in, and Long Player is a thousand-year-long, never-repeating piece of music. It started playing on the 31st of December, 1999, and it will continue until that same date in 2999, when it will start again. This was composed by Jem Finer and produced by Art Angel. It is now held by the Long Player Trust, as Rowley said. And what it is is a thousand-year-long piece of music, but, of course, what it really is is a framework for thinking about priorities, about relationships, about our engagement, of course, with time and space over a much longer span than our own lifetimes, or even the lifetimes of our civilization. And it's about thinking how we might change our perception of our relationship to all these elements um, and offer a kind of different way of perceiving the priorities, as I've said, of our reality. It's inherently optimistic, of course, because it wants to carry on for at least a thousand years. But how it will be carried and communicated is obviously up to future generations to take forward and think about. But all of this depends on our relationship with the natural world, which of course is changing very fast. Urgency is rising as much as it looks like the sea levels will. And the question is how we can communicate the situation we find ourselves in now um, to ourselves and of course to future generations. What is the best way of communicating things? Often threshold moments of perception happen around this idea of communication. We can think of the, ra the radical shift in how we uh, perceive cetaceans, whales, um, with the discovery of the whale song and what it meant in the 70s. And this leads me to that, obviously, a well-observed truism that about 100 years ago, uh, many people had horses, but, of course, only the rich had cars. Now, 100 years later, many people have cars, but only the rich have horses. <laughs> how the stables have turned... <laughs> Now, that's a slightly uh, cringe-inducing uh, comment. I'd like to thank my son, Tom, for bringing that um, <laughs> insight to my attention. But it does reflect how our, our relationship with the natural world is changing. And what kind of tools can we bring to this relationship in terms of advocacy for a better future? We bring, of course, sound and image. We bring voice and narrative. We can think about concern and anger, even. But we can also think about wonder, celebration, and joy. Seeing is not only seeing. If in the right hands, in the right eyes, it can be looking... Listening, of course, is not only hearing. Proper listening is a very different thing indeed. When life and work merge into the single space of experience, you know you're in for a different story and a different scale of encounter. And that's exactly what we have with our wonderful guests tonight, as Rowley has suggested. Chris Watson started his musical and creative life with the influential band Cabaret Voltaire. And after moving uh, into television, he has become the world's leading sound recordist of wildlife and natural phenomena, as well as diverse human activity. He's an installation artist, a sound artist. He records for the label Touch, and of course he is across our televisions and our radios with extraordinary encounters with sound. If it can be listened to uh, and heard, um, it, there's a fair chance that Chris has recorded it. I would like to say, of course, that he's also almost definitely recorded the sound of one hand clapping. Um, but I think when we, when we come on in a minute to welcome our guests, I'd like you to bring all your flesh-based digital devices together, not just one, of course. Um, David Attenborough needs no introduction. He is a, a pioneering broadcaster, naturalist, filmmaker across the arts and humanities, the uh, pioneering controller of BBC Two, uh, the director of programmes for BBC One and Two, whose interest in the natural world goes back to the earliest years of his childhood. There are simply no better conversationalists to come and engage with this theme in the framework of long play in the British Library than the two you're about to give the warmest welcome to. Please do welcome Chris Watson and David Attenborough. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, 
amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, I, I always enjoy our conversations uh, yeah. over you know, the years, but there are a few places like this that we've had the chance to have a... Yeah, most of places like the North Pole or yeah. uh, <laughs> the Mato Grosso or somewhere. Yeah. I actually I remember, the place I remember is the Galapagos Islands. Um, I can't even remember what programme it was for, but we, we were, you were doing a piece about marine iguanas coming out of the water to warm up, but also to expel salt from their nostrils. And so we were going to do it at the hottest part of the day. So we were going to do it at midday and we were on the equator and we turned up this piercing equatorial heat on a piece of exposed lava. I remember Gavin came to us and said, I'm sorry, we can't shoot at the moment. The sun's in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> and the equator at midday. <laughs> Perhaps you should have thought of this a bit earlier. But it was at those moments that we, could, we sort of retired into conversation. And there were the aspects I always enjoyed. I enjoyed them because I, you're such a great sound ally because you started out as a sound recordist. Um, well, I started out as a, as, a, as a television producer, I suppose, really. But um, uh, when I first... It's difficult to think, back in 1952, which is when I joined television, um, hardly any sound or picture were recorded. Everything was live up at Alexander Palace. And I was um, a producer. Uh, and when I wanted to go to Africa for the first time and shoot 60 millers of film, which the BBC had never shot before. Mm. Um, uh, we hadn't got enough money to, uh, to pay your exorbitant fees, you see, <laughs> uh, of recorders. So uh, Charles Lagos was the cameraman and I was the recordist. And that's what you call faute de mieux. I mean, I didn't understand it at all. I just thought you put on a, took a microphone, you turned the thing on. Yeah, it is a bit different from that, isn't it, really? Well, not, not much, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, it, was that, it was that that I always found inspiring about, let's see if this works, about your work. Yes. Well... Uh, I mean, that's just such a cool posture to establish for a sound recorder. <laughs> I've, I've modelled myself on that for years. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not doing badly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that thing that I was slinging around my neck uh, was a, the, the only portable recorder that there was in 1954. <coughs> it ran on, <coughs> on, I think it was 12 U2 batteries, yeah, yeah, batteries yeah. Of, about, like sections of uh, broom handles. I mean, they were, and it was very heavy. And the just microphone, the reason I'm holding the microphone there was that the microphone acted doubled as a speaker as well as a risk. So if I wanted to hear what I was doing, I put it to my ear. Well, I think what we can do, because um, we've managed to collect some recordings, thanks to Cheryl Tipp from the National Sound Archive, who's dug out a lot of your old recordings, which are held here in the library. And <clears throat> this, I believe, this is Sierra Leone, isn't it? It is, yes. In the, a swamp. The first, was this the first Zoo Quest? It was, yes. So this, this is what I would call now an, an atmosphere recording. So it's a scene setting recording. Yeah, as far as I was concerned, this was really central stuff. And actually, <laughs> background, I mean, we're a swamp absolutely alive with frogs of several different species. Let's hear it. All singing. Well, it's really good. I mean, it's, it's 1954. It's an exceptional recording. But I think what to bear in mind is you, you, that was a very early tape recorder, but right. it was a real-to-real -real recorder. Yeah. And actually, they're, they're really good quality. I mean, there's I still... And, that, and, and the microphone was just that very big thing. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Can, can... But it worked as a device for, for, for capturing a, a scene of the place. And yeah. the thing I like about that is that it, 
it's the most eloquent way of describing a place. You know, you, you don't well, need... Well, certainly if you shut your eyes, it, that takes reality yeah, back. Yeah, that. that's what I like about it and about that, about that technique. Yeah. But you very quickly adapted different techniques uh, and started to focus more as well on things like... Oops, hang on. That. Well, that's still the L2 recorder down there. Yeah, so yeah. that's the reel-to-reel... -reel Recorder, yeah. but what I'm interested in is that parabolic reflector that you, you were using. This is, is this Guiana? Yeah, no, yes, that's right. Um, because that's something that was, I mean, I've got photographs of a, an American ornithologist miles north from Cornell University yeah. in the 1930s, 1932, using a parabolic reflector. There is no digital device that's been invented since then that improves upon the ability of a parabolic reflector to focus sound. It, it acts like, like, as it were, a searchlight in reverse. I mean, it focuses all the, all, uh, yes. There it, we are. <laughs> and and that's, that's rather better than that because that's a, made of aluminium that's, yeah. that I have. The thing I like, yeah. So th what, what, what happens with this, this is a very special curve, parabolic curve, x equals y squared. And if you put a, microphone at the focal point of that any sound that hits the dish parallel to the axis and that's the key it's very has to be very accurately aimed parallel any sound that hits the dish parallel to the axis will be reflected back to a common point called the focal point so if you can contrive to put a microphone there and aim your dish accurately it will pick up sounds with a 10 degree axis it, it's still, it, I mean, it's tempting to talk of it as though it's a searchlight, but actually it doesn't bring you the sound as if you were close up, does it? Well, it, 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 it amplifies. It doesn't have electronic amplification, so it's acoustic amplification. So it, it, it amplifies what you're pointing it at, but it doesn't amplify sounds to the side. There's a good example, because I've got a recording that Cheryl found of that very trip. These are howler monkeys, which, did you know what they were at the time? No, I, I heard this, I was sleeping in a hammock. I've never been to South America be jungle before, and I heard this noise. not actually distorted you you think it's, it's almost yeah like a train in a tunnel or something and it, well i can imagine hearing that at night in the middle in of the, the dark night. in a hammock and actually um, <laughs> no, i'll be quite i'll be quite actually the monkeys howler monkeys um and they they sing at night they have big throat pouches which amplify the sound and it's um a, a spacing mechanism which the trout troops use and sing competitively with, with one another. I'm sure the jaws have some um, effects on the sound as well. Well, I suppose so. They, they move the jaws, I think, as they do it. But, but of course, they have this big balloon-like... Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what, I've got one of my recordings I'd like to play now. <clears throat> and this, is from, this is a reflector recording made with this reflector. But again, what it demonstrates is the ability to pick out sounds from uh, of individuals and this is a recording of a robin song so common garden bird in fact it's probably was, there was one probably singing in Houston Square this evening because this is the winter song of a robin one of the few birds that sings in winter but, but this was the song that accompanied you, you did a tweet of the day mm. I think was it last Christmas mm. it was um, and this is the song that accompanied it it's actually recorded in my suburban garden in Newcastle but it it demonstrates again how the reflector works. So something which an, an ordinary microphone just can't do. So it's still of significant use to me mm. today. And there's no replacement of it. Yet. There's nothing. There's nothing been. There's nothing better. Which is what the interesting thing is than 
than that, and it's acoustic amplification. Mm -hmm. So it's noise free, there's no hiss or electronic noise associated with it. I mean, um, and although that was very big and cumbersome, uh, it, it worked on valves, I don't mind telling you. Uh, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, and I think there were eight or ten valves in it, and, and carrying that around with delicate valves, it was very dangerous, very unreliable. And I desperately wanted a better thing than that, and I went to the best tape recorder in this country, uh, I think the name is Ferragal. Yeah, it yeah. was. It yeah. was Ferragal. And they were the standard BBC uh, uh, tape machines, <laughs> reel to reel. And I said, what I want is something smaller and I can ca easily carry about. Uh, can't you modify this device? And this chap who he was, he was fairly senior in Ferragal. I don't think he was a managing director, but he was a fairly senior guy. And he tapped me on the knee, he said, laddie. <laughs> When you've got a world beater, you don't mess about with it. <laughs> and, and the company was in bankruptcy within five years. <laughs> well, um, Nagra was adopted as the... And then the Swiss. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm interested again how you developed the featured sounds of birds. And in this case, this was a trip to Papua New Guinea and a family of birds that I know you're very interested in, the birds of paradise. Indeed, yeah. Uh, well, um, we, this was in 55, 56, and, and I was desperate to see birds of paradise, which had haunted me since I was a child, mainly because they're so beautiful I mean, and astonishing. Um, but we had got to the situation whereby you couldn't very well show a picture of a bird, which was obviously singing, without showing the sound of its song. Uh, but the trouble with um, the cameras at that time was that they uh, made a very loud noise. They still uh, do. Uh, uh, yeah. No, no, they don't, Chris. You're, you're being very <laughs> sensitive now. Electronic cameras don't make a lot of noise, but clockwork cameras did. They did, so, uh, like, a, like a concrete mixer. So uh, we, it took us a long time, out because of <laughs> sheer incompetence on our part, before we actually found a bird of paradise that was about to display. And it was in the dawn, and it was of a classic species, um, Count Raj's bird of paradise. Um, and we found a display site, and we went up in the dark, and we got set up. And then, uh, to start with, the, the, the bird came up, landed on a branch, uh, and Charles Lagos, who was the cameraman, my companion, I would say, why aren't you shooting, Charles? He said, there's no sun, there's no, with the dawn, there's no light, I can't do anything. I'm filming, so he's filming away. Uh, and as I say, this noise was going on with the, with the camera. So I couldn't record if I wanted to. And I kept saying, Charles, that's enough, let me record. And Charles said, no, no, I've got a bit more, just I want to change lens, he changed lens, let me play. So finally, I shut up, let me, let me play something. And I p turned on the recorder, and the bird went, wah, 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 and then it went, wah, wah, and then it flew off. <laughs> so, of course, when we came back, uh, we had, to, the only thing I had to do, uh, I, to try and match his film, was to take these two calls and join them on a piece of tape, end to end. Ooh, so it went yeah. round and round and round and round. This is the, you've got a picture. Yeah, of I did to compound it. your embarrassment. No, not a picture. I've actually got the recording. So you got the recording. <laughs> and then suddenly he flexed his wings and started his dance. In a frenzy of excitement, he threw his ruby plumes above his head, shrieking with excitement. When that went out, my old professor of zoology from Cambridge sent me such a nice letter. He said, many congratulations. I've spent my life dreaming about what you've been dreaming about, about birds of paradise, because he was an ornithologist. Birds of paradise, I never thought I would see them. And then I saw it on television. And it was so exciting. You must feel wonderfully pleased. But there is an observation which apparently you haven't made anything of and I ought to tell you about now. And that is, I watched that and the sounds that you had of that bird singing, he sang in groups of nine 
and then a group of seven. Never two nines together, <laughs> never two seven together. And I think you should write a learned paper about this uh, for the ornithological union. Now, I had to reply to him, you know, that unfortunately, this was just a piece of tape that was going around. <laughs> so it had to be alternate. No, but there you are. But it, what it means is that actually, we find it now, even now, that, or no, perhaps 50 years ago, there was a sort of naivete amongst scientists about sound recordings and even about pictures. Yes. They, they didn't understand the technology and so are capable of making some really big howlers like that. I stopped him from producing that, his learned paper, anyway. <laughs> but that conversely, it, filmmakers are informing the scientific community as well. With, I mean, Blue Planet, for instance, too, you know, with oh, remarkable well, observations. Uh, natural history, uh, we couldn't exist without I would be mad to make a natural history film without getting involved with the scientific community. And uh, that's, that's, they point us in the right direction. They tell us all sorts of things we don't know. Um, and, of course, these days, sound, re sound recording and picture recording are part of the tools of an observation yes, yeah, natural yeah. history scientist. Yeah, 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 but it wasn't awesome. then. When we started to work together, I think it was Life of Birds, probably in um, perhaps 1995, um, the techniques then I was using were what you've just been describing now, microphones to record birdsong, reflectors to record birdsong. But then we started with life in the undergrowth. And I had to adapt to my techniques significantly because all of a sudden, um, from trying to film and record animals and other birds that were in trees or at, at a distance, we were filming tiny animals in a, uh, in, in a huge scale, but from extreme close-up. Yes, the, 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 the theme of the series, we'd done lots of uh, themes, uh, programmes and series about birds and lots about mammals. But of course, the most numerous animal forms on this planet are invertebrates, uh, insects primarily, but many other things, I mean, slugs and millipedes and so on, which aren't insects, spiders. Uh, and so we, uh, I, I suggested that we did a series. What to call it was a problem, actually. Uh, what do you, how can you, what do you call it life of something? Because we, this was part of a life of birds and life of mammals and so on. Life of something. You couldn't call it life of, of anything. I couldn't think what to call it. And eventually I hit on the idea of calling life in the undergrowth. And that enabled us to do all that. These, all these different things in which, which you recorded. <clears throat> so I started, instead of using large microphones and very directional microphones, I started to use <clears throat> these, which we're wearing tonight, so-called personal microphones, which are made this small, so that they're not, they're not made this small for any particular sound characteristic. They're made small, so they're very low profile and camera. I imagine that not a lot of recording of invertebrates has been made. Have they, Chris? I mean, you <coughs> certainly were the first to record quite a lot of things. Yeah, I think, the sci again, the scientific community are now using techniques, mostly of animals in captivity and in studio environments. But I was concerned about when we were out on location to capture the sounds that were being filmed in such close-up detail by people like Martin Dorn with his super close-up lenses. So I suddenly thought, well, you know, much as I enjoy recording David with these small microphones, I could perhaps use his, your microphone to get him really close to things. And that's what we did here in South Africa. These are Matabele ants, which I was amazed at one, because it, the Matabele ants are quite aggressive. Well, they, they, they raid ground-nesting termites. And I think they, they were they named after a a tribe, a tribe was, yeah, 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 who, who would have this mm. technique of this sort of pincer movement, maybe copied from the ants in the first place. So they would send out scouts to find ground nesting termites, and then the ants would swarm and, and do this attacking from different positions, but in, in silence, in quietness. They always moved to attack in absolute quietness, and as soon as they'd collected and dismembered a lot of the termites, they carried their booty and the food, these, these um, disconnected termites, back to the nest. But as they did so, they then started to not vocalise, but stridulate, make this incredible sound. OK, take two. Um, I'm starting to gather to return after the raid.
there are thousands of amps on the, of this little microphone. Do you hear? Yeah, yeah. I can't. <laughs> well, it's a very high frequency hissing sound. Well, we ought to explain what stridulation is. Yeah. Um, uh, the ants, the, 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 the middle section of the insect uh, the, has a head and then behind on the thorax there's a little comb on the front of the, of, of, of the hard exoskeleton and the ants move that against the head against the, the, the thorax um, and that makes this sort of like a comb you know, being stridulated yeah. and they make this very high pitched noise but you, I mean, you, um, I, I think, were one of the first to observe all this and to record it. And we came to the conclusion that the, the, when the Matabeliants set out, they were like, they were like a raid, raiding mm, party. Mm. I mean, they, yeah, they, they so. were quiet, going because they'd, they'd, the scouts had decided which the Termite Hill was going to be that they were going to raid. And they went up in silence. And then there was this terrific battle in which bodies were hurtling out of the entrances um, as, as the termites were, were being dragged out by the Matabele ants, which are big and ferocious. And then ending with the, band, with the ants carrying these corpses of the, of the killed the termites that they could back to the nest to feast on them. And you, you, it was, I know it's anthropomorphic and all that, but in fact you really felt that they were, it was a war song, a victory yes, song. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure it has to be communicative in some way, but yeah. it, was, it was remarkable. And they follow this a trail back as well, presumably a pheromone yeah. trail, but then they were much wider and there was this whole collection of food that they were going back with. It was astonishing. And yeah. that, that really, that was the one series that really got me interested in Recording real detail. I remember, I think I said to you, do you think, think that they make any of these noises underground? And you said, well, let's find out. Yes, so I took your microphone off. <laughs> yes, you took my microphone off and? That was into a termite. Into yes. a termite, no, <clears throat> yeah. Because at the very, in the same place, you're right, it was actually the same day. We finished with the filming the Matabeliants and then you did your piece to camera at the very end of the series, the, the great upsumming of the series, where you stood by this huge termite mound and said, if mankind was to disappear from the planet within a month, there would be no change. If invertebrates were to disappear from the planet, then within four weeks, uh, there'd be absolute chaos. But I remember the series ended in disaster with you n in Very desperation because so. you lowered your microphone into the termite hole, didn't you? And you pulled it out. Reveal what happened. Well, <laughs> this was, I think it was sadly, that, that microphone's now gone to the great microphone maker <laughs> repair shop. So I dangled down a, it was down a termite chimney. They have the, the, the full of these such um, chimney affairs. So I lowered this microphone down <clears throat> with a windshield on because I thought, oh, I'd seen, again, one of your early zoo quests with soldier termites aggressively attacking any intruder into the termite mound. So I dropped this thing down and I heard this, actually. I can play it. And there's a a section where you hear it sounds like a fight in a pub, but then <laughs> slowly the, um, the termites start to alarm and they bang their heads on the inside of the termite mound, which makes this comb-like, more, much more rhythmic rattling sound. So there are the termites around the microphone and then that. <clears throat> I thought, fantastic, you know, I've got this the first time I've ever recorded inside a termite mound. So I pulled my microphone out to reveal the windshield had gone. No. It had been removed by soldier termites. And nine pounds <laughs> were <at> microphone <laughs> windshield. <clears throat> You're laughing now. It was at the time, whenever it was, 15 years ago, that was a lot of money. <laughs> I remember I was, you saying, I, the Bairns, I'll have no shoes this Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're here tonight, Alex and Lewis. They still have to share the same shoes. 
<laughs> but it was remarkable. It was yeah. uh, one of the first times I'd had equipment attacked like that. But I was really pleased to get it. There was a whole other series of micro sounds that I enjoyed in that, um, in, in that series, including these, the giant earthworms of Gippsland in Victoria, where we went, went to after this occasion. Before you re recorded, I ought to explain. For no reason that anybody can be logical, or logical reason that I can think of, this one area in, in uh, southern Australia, uh, alone in the world, they have giant earthworms. Uh, and they, they are huge, huge, I mean, like this. Um, and you may say, how long is the longest giant earthworm? <laughs> well, the answer is that it depends how hard you pull it, really, <laughs> and it might break it. So there's no, nobody can actually tell you what the record is, but it's certainly kind of like that. Uh, and the only way, you, was you walking across the uh, pastures of the, in, in Gippsland, it suddenly hears as though someone has pulled a lavatory chain. I mean, there's suddenly a great swoosh and gurgling noise. And you look around and there's nobody there, nothing there at all. And it's down deep in the soil that there is, where, which, where water gathers, that these things are slurping around in their tunnels. And you've got it. Well, they actually, the, the interesting thing was the scientists who we were with used it as a method to survey Mm. if these animals were here, because it was only because I think a road was being carved through some farmland and they cut into a field edge and discovered these earthworms and some of the um, eggs. The eggs, which were enormous. Mm. Um, and that's why we, we were Have you got there. the sound? I have, yeah. We, we, I made a whole series of these recordings. So this isn't a, communica it's a communicative sound. It's as these giant earthworms withdraw into their <laughs> slimy burrows. And the end scene was David doing a, you know, one of his usual spectacular pieces to camera and then turning and walking off across this field. And so I gave this track of what I call the worm, giant earthworm medley of sounds <laughs> to accompany David walking off into the distance after delivering his piece to camera. It didn't get used. <laughs> They preserved, they preferred 110 piece or four, which is they normally do, yeah. <laughs> That's it. And you've got more than that. Well, do you think they want to hear it? <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> I might have got a few, a few more seconds. Oh, I have. Okay. But I have to tell you, that's a sound that's rarely heard in South Australia. <laughs> <these days. coughs> well, they weren't, they were, they were uncommon animals. Yeah, yeah. Or certainly the discovery of them. Yeah. Um, there's one more from that series I'd like to play, which had, for me, sort of serious significance. And again, a remarkable discovery, I think, for the scientific community, as well as myself when I got to record it, the caterpillar of a large blue butterfly. Um, do, you, do you want to explain it or shall I? Yes. Uh, well, no, you go ahead. So, the, I mean, they're, they're found in this country, aren't they? It's a, yes, a, they are. a British butterfly. And the caterpillars are collected from the woodland floor by wood ants and taken back to the ants' nest. And you would think that really is the end of the story for that particular caterpillar. So, taken into this, what you would assume is a very hostile environment. However, the caterpillar remains in there, and it was discovered by somebody from the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology that they stridulate, these caterpillars stridulate inside the ant's nest, and the sound that they produce causes the ants to feed this caterpillar, not to kill it and eat it. And this caterpillar does this. It has a little hard internal organ, which you can actually see because the caterpillars are translucent and they vibrate this organ inside their bodies and produce this mechanical sound and that and maybe there's some chemical process as well but then stimulates the wood ants to feed and sustain this animal rather than prey upon it I thought that was an astonishing story and we went down we were at 
um, Mike Salisbury's house for the, the start of, of Life in the Undergrowth. And it was on the, this sound, and this piece was on the six o'clock news as sort of an and finally. Because um, I remember I got a phone call before I, I went down in the afternoon and I thought it was Gavin or uh, somebody the camera and playing a trick. He said, oh, hello, this is BBC News. I would like to use your caterpillar sound on the six o'clock news. <laughs> 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 but anyway, this is it. Um, I thought at the time, and this was recorded, it had to be recorded in captivity, temporary captivity. So this was in a radio studio in Bristol and recorded with a very special device, which sadly I didn't have, called a particle velocity microphone, which was loaned to me by the ITE. <laughs> This sort of parasitism is, is, is particularly interesting because the large blue butterfly uh, has only been clinging on to survive. It's reduced very much in numbers and close to extinction in southern England. And, and Lepidopterists simply couldn't understand how they were going to conserve it. Um, and it wasn't until they discovered that this, this relationship between the ants and, and the way the caterpillars the, of the large blue persuaded the ants to take into their nest and feed it, that um, uh, uh, they were able to work out how to save the large blue because the ants will only live in a particular kind of turf with a particular kind of grass, and yes. that depended on sheep. <clears throat> so it was a very complex thing, but marvellous illustration of how complex the webs of the natural world are. Yes, and how such a simple sound mm. has a profound effect. I assume. In this case, we're hearing it as a sound, but in fact, it's a, the stridulation is a vibration. So I can only imagine the ants detect the vibe. They don't have ears. They, they feel the sound through their um, exoskeletons and, and maybe the, the feelers. But well, they, they, still, they still must be aware of sound. So although they don't have ears, they, they can hear. In that sense. Yes, they have, they have I what's suppose called you're playing near, with words. near field sound. So they're sensitive to vibrations within yeah. a few centimetres yes. around them. <clears throat> At this stage, David, I have to mention the M word, music. The what? The music. Music, yes. Um, <laughs> there's a considerable... I know, I find it hard in front of a, an audience to mention this. I'm not a great fan of music in natural history films. But, <laughs> however, again, you were probably one of the first people to record what I thought was appropriate music to use in your programmes because it was... It was local music, it was music from the place and mm. of the place. And again, you've captured you know, a remarkable series of recordings, all of which are in the National Sound Archive. Um, when you were filming, you were also recording local music, um, indigenous music, tribal music, more generally called world music now. Uh, quite a remarkable collection. And this is one of my favourites. I think this is from, it may, if not all the Zoo Quest, but from the first Zoo Quest recorded in Sierra Leone. Mm, that's it. The interesting thing about that was in fifth, that was in '54, and uh, in upcountry Sierra Leone in West Africa, they had never seen a tape recorder before. Well, there hadn't been yeah. tape recorders there before, um, and so. Uh, when I'd record something, uh, I would, would play it to, with a, through the, actually through the microphone, play it so people could listen. And of course, they were entranced by hearing themselves. And the, the head drummer, who was the, running the uh, head musician, uh, was fairly put out that, uh, that the, uh, we were being regarded as being so clever and so successful. And he said, um, 
So I played something to him, and he listened to it, and he said, well, that was no good. I mean, that was, that was, that was a, simple, a simple piece of drumming. Anybody could, and your machine could learn that easily, but I'll, <laughs> I'll play you something that your machine can't learn. <laughs> and then he, he gave a dazzling display of drumming. I mean, really amazing, Steinbrenner, you see. And he said, okay, you've tried that. You see, <laughs> of course, when I rounded it back and played it here, he was absolutely <laughs> I've got an example that, that um, I recorded when we had a trip. I think it was the life of mammals to Mali, to that Dogon village, Tirelli. And again, you made a comment to me, and I'm, I don't even think it was to, you made it to camera. We were filming women pounding millet with huge pestle and mortars. And, uh, and the, a lot of them had small babies on cloths tied to the back. And you said, look, you know, the, Look at that. And he said, the first rhythms that a Dogon baby and child hears and feels is its mother pounding millet, so with a very musical rhythm. This is what I recorded. <laughs> Well, of course, there's a lot of um, a lot of research has been done recently. Uh, when I say recently, over the last ten ten years or so, uh, about what a, a child in the womb mm. can hear, mm. um, and um, uh, you, you can hear the, the the noises and the rhythms that go on in the body. Uh, and if if the, the woman is, who did that every day, you know, to pound the, pound the cassava for for the food, heard that every day, it must have an effect. I once was in New in New in uh, San Francisco, San Francisco Airport, and uh, home of hippydom, you know, at the time, and a, and a man with long hair, uh, and and I suppose had been. Uh, on the pot, one thing or another, but he had, he had a little baby in a, in oh, a right. rucksack sort of thing, you see, uh, and he, he recognised me and we, we started a conversation. <laughs> and uh, he said, was I recording sound? Yeah, I said, yes, I was. And he said, it's very important, you know, it's very important what the child hears. It's very, very important. When this little guy, when we knew what he were expecting, we paid... Bach's Takara and Feud in D minor to him every morning. Wow. I said, did you? Yes. I said, yeah. We hold him up to cool my wife's stomach. And I said, did it have an effect? Oh, sure, he said. I said, what happens? He said, when he hears Bach's Takara and Feud in D minor now, he screams. <laughs> <laughs> Here's, here's, I know this is very important to you, this style of music. This is gamelan, yeah. and it's, it's a really beautiful sound. And it's, this is a recording, I mean, again, he must have made in the mid-1950s, but yeah. it's a sound that just rings so true today, and it's just really beautiful. It's an orchestra, gamelan orchestra, I would describe it as anyway, but it's um, just a remarkable series of rhythms and tones. <laughs> That is it, Chris, because you haven't got a proper balance. I mean, you hear that dong, uh, dong, dong, which is one one particular gong actually, uh, which is which is responsible for the rhythm. But that was too prominent. I mean, it wouldn't have been better with a multi microphone setup. Well, I'd, no, I think you just make it more difficult. I, I, I'm I'm all for 
you know, I, I do a lot in surround sound these days, as, as you know, because I'm interested in the sounds of places and spaces, but um, you make it more complicated. Uh, and and you, you normally, with things like that, you don't get more than one chance, do you? you, know, you no, well, I mean, I had no alternative because I just had one yeah. microphone. You had, a pr you had precious, privileged opportunities. That's one of the things I like about, you know, what you did when you were starting out recording and what I do. I like that sense of being able to, you know, not say, right, so let's stop, let's put set a multi-microphone setup. And sure, you could maybe do better, and I'm sure now there are orchestral, you know, recordings made with, with lots of microphones that have more depth to them. But what I like about that is the immediacy of it and the fact you were there on location doing that. It wasn't contrived, you know, later in the studio. It's a live location, or it was a live location recording. And, of course, the Gamelan Orchestra it's the, is the largest group uh, orchestral ensemble outside of Western Symphony Orchestra. Mm. I mean, it's a very interesting question as to why, in fact, there is only those two situations. I mean, no other uh, musical ensemble that I can think of anywhere in the world, a tribal one, is as complicated as a, a, a gamelan, which has as many as 30 or 40 or, uh, musicians, all playing uh, with the score out of memory, without a written score at all, and their metallophones, like the xylophones, and the keys, and you, you play like that. And, and, and they, the, the complexity of those instruments is mm. just remarkable because when you play it, it the, the key sounds doing and echoes like that, and, and then he has to damp it. Okay, so he, he's, he's playing a tune with, with one hand and playing one note behind with the other hand, dampening it. So the, comple the virtuosity of those those musicians is quite extraordinary. But also they have like these clockwork rhythms, very accurate as well. It sounds like a clock, almost like a metronome. Yeah, well, that's, that's that, that, that is one, one particular, um, um, uh, it's called a cheng cheng, uh, is, is gong is used, uh, and he sets the rhythm and, and keeps the rhythm going, yeah. And are they different village to village? Oh, yes. Not only, not only are they, uh, the gamelan, uh, different from village to village, playing their own tunes, the, ma the master musician composes the, the traditional ones, but he also composes ones specially for the village, and they also have their own scales. There are two different scales in Bali. Um, and when the village as a group uh, decides they're going to commission a master bronzesmith to make a gamelan for them, 30 instruments, it's a very big financial ingestion. The master musician goes and the, 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 the brass founder produces keys and says, this is the scale. And is it, are the intervals what, as he would like it? And the master musician may say, well, that third note up, I think it would be quite exciting if you made that just a little sharper. And, and then the whole of, the, uh, whole of the, uh, the, uh, the gamelan is tuned to those things. And Benjamin Britten, uh, and, and mm. told me this himself, that he was inspired by uh, Oriental gamelan music and used it in his Prince of the Pagodas. But when he was in Bali, the, the gamelan rehearses, every village has its own gamelan, the gamelan rehearses every evening, and as he would drive through the darkness in Bali, he would hear a gamelan rehearsing, and he would know with, his, with the sharpness of his composer's mind, he would know that that particular harmony had to be that particular village, so he knew where he was. Wow. Isn't that extraordinary? Wow, wow, yeah. yeah. I've heard as well that they would, a lot of the time, they, 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 they can be appreciated from a distance as well, rather than being sort of close up, because the sound travels yes. through the forest. Yes, it does. Yeah. Village to village. Well, I, no, I don't think, because the village is quite far apart, at least when it uh, was when I were there, um, but, but the gamelan plays during festivals and, it, and, and it, it plays continuously for hours and hours and hours. And uh, you, it's rather, I, I, like many modern music now, I feel that suddenly it's just one thing changes. And when mm. one, one particular thing changes with a slightly different harmony, you've been listening too far, 
with half an ear as you chew beetle and conversations, and you suddenly realize that then now the rituals are going to move into a new phase of ritual. And so you go back and listen to the thing. And that's many ways, I'm, this is Philistine talk for me, but, but when I listen to a lot of, of music which, which is repetitive over and over and over again, just that one change which tells you what's, what's happening with the, with the musical score and the musical plot, as it were. So are these long performances as well, then? Yeah, oh, they go on for three or four hours, five wow. hours. Wow, wow. Mm. Have we, what? are we coming to the end? No, we're nowhere near the end, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got, I've got a question, I've got a question I want right. to ask you yeah. in public before we come to the end, so I'll hold it in, my, in reserve. Go along, Chris, what's all good? <laughs> okay. Right, well, for a change, then. Oh, we're supposed to... There we are. <laughs> <clears throat> we should, because the long player trust is about time, and deep time in particular, and there are two things, this is sort of the final section, if you like, but there are two trips that we've had where I've thought significantly about time and, and how it's affected me. And the most recent one was this, when we went to Argentina about two years ago to go and look at this giant dinosaur, this sauropod, which had been discovered. I think it is the largest, isn't it, mm. that's, that's been discovered. This is in Chubut province of um, Patagonia, so southern Argentina. So the, the, um, this is the femur of this dinosaur, the leg bone, which is longer than David, that he laid next to, posed next to for that photograph. And it was astonishing enough the whole experience, and, I, and I'd urge you to go and watch the film, Attenborough and the Giant Dinosaur. I think it's still uh, online. But then we went to this place, far less spectacular, but we were taken, this is in the foot, still in Argentina, in the foothills of the Andes, and we had a mammoth car jet. We flew for a few hours, and then we were driven for six or seven hours, I remember, to this place and asked not to divulge the location of it by the scientists. Because what is in front of you in this picture is a nest of a dinosaur. I don't know if it's the same sauropod or another, another yeah, one. Yeah. This is a nest site of a dinosaur. These eggs were laid a hundred million years ago, maybe more. And will you explain what happens, happens to the landscape? Because I found this astonishing. Well, it was eroded out. You can see some segments there uh, on the right-hand side. Yeah. They're, they're, they're little plates of, of dinosaur shell. Uh, and uh, I have to admit, I'm a sort of kleptomaniac. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I love collecting things. And, uh, <laughs> and we, but we were with a very, very responsible paleontological professor. <laughs> Who, who, who uh, and asked him also not to someone, touch anything? Uh, someone else from the from the, from the ministry, <laughs> um, and um, I couldn't restrain myself. I, I suddenly a marvelous piece, like a big piece of a soup plate, and I picked it up and said, oh, "Look at that!" You see, and I suddenly realised that there are people on either side of me looking at me, <laughs> and the camera was actually turning, and I said yes, and I'm putting it back where I found it. <laughs> And it's still there. I think almost recognise it up there on the right. Oh, beautiful. But if from a time point of view, what I what I found really profound was that that landscape was like that a hundred million years ago, and obviously it changed significantly, but then been eroded back, as I understood it, to this original yeah. state. Yeah, and well, these eggshells were still the original surface. There. Yeah. I mean, they're fossilised. Even some on the inside had imprints of baby dinosaur skin mm. on them. I mean, it was just, as a piece of time to look at that, I found it very, I found it hard to comprehend just being there in what looked like effectively a, a building site, this huge area. Yeah. You know, as you can see, treeless, very low-lying vegetation, very few birds, but the, the shells of animals that were there a hundred mm. million years ago. I need to move on. We need to progress to this last place, very different from this. Frozen planet. 
had the privilege of working with you on 2010, 2011. And we went to Antarctica and eventually to the South Pole. But as I do before, I've had many trips with David, I, I did a bit of research obviously into the place. And this is a place rich in history. This is Mount Erebus, which is on Ross Island. So just off the coast of continental Antarctica. This is the Ross Sea, which when we arrived in um, late December, I think it was, it was still frozen. So that's the surface of the sea, frozen to about three or four metres in depth. And what you can see over there is the land and Mount Erebus, the, vol the volcano. And we were staying at the American base, the McMurdo United States Science Foundation base. And just down the coast was Terra Nova, Captain Scott's hut, from which he embarked on his um, trip to the South Pole. A little further down the coast um, was Shackleton's hut, Nimrod, where Shackleton would have arrived to had he made his transantarctic journey successfully. And so we were in a place where when, when um, Scott went down, he took with him a photographer, Herbert Ponting, who made a film, I think it was for Gourmont Pictures, called The Great White Silence. And so I imagined that that would be the case, that, that in fact, not so much silence, because that doesn't really exist, uh, even in a vacuum, but a very quiet place. And, and indeed, that's, that's the case. When the wind doesn't blow, when it's not blowing 180 mile an hour winds, um, it, it's very quiet. There are a few birds there. There's an Adelie penguin colony, which we filmed David at, and there were a few Antarctic skewers. The bizarre thing is there are no insects there. So when there are no birds, there is virtually no sound apart from the wind drawing over the ice. And we went to this place on Ross Island, which is Terra Nova. This is the hut that Scott and his party walked out from in October, I think. 1910 and never came back to. So we had the real privilege of being invited in by uh, the New Zealand Science Foundation who maintain the hut. David had been there 17 years previously, I remember. And I was at this, this point, I was, I was there to record David's pieces and any other sounds. I've been recording the sounds of glaciers and ice um, but I'd yet to get underwater because the Austral summer hadn't really started to melt the ocean. But we went into this hut, which had this remarkable atmosphere and presence. But I also thought a very special acoustic. It, it was really quiet, but very dry. And Antarctica is the driest continent. There's no humidity there. So things, that's one reason why things have been preserved so well. But we sat down in this hut and you just told us this story. And I don't think it's ever been transmitted. I think it was something for the New Zealanders. But I found this really powerful piece of sound in a, in a place where there was, at the time, virtually no other sound. And I'll just spin through a couple of images of inside the hut as I played this piece, which thankfully you've, you've let me play. I first uh, came to this site uh, 17 years ago. Uh, and I was uh, one of the first here. Uh, indeed, I, I had the key to the lock and I opened it and I remember very vividly opening the door and coming into this place. And there was a smell of tar and rope and a kind of musty smell. And I looked around and saw these extraordinarily intimate things, clothing, horses, uh, saddles, um, bunks, and I suddenly became aware of something around me that became quite oppressive. Um, it wasn't particularly aggressive, but certainly if I was ever to think about uh, feeling ghosts or personalities, uh, it would be here. Um, and it became so oppressive that, that eventually I actually had to leave and go for a walk outside. 
Um, and by the time I came back, uh, the rest of the team was here, and uh, so we were putting up lights and uh, bringing in the cameras. And uh, and I walked in, and uh, that atmosphere had gone. And it was well, it wasn't like any other place, of course, because it's an extraordinary place. But that oppressive feeling uh, had disappeared. But even so, if ever there was a place that held the personality of the people who had lived in it a century ago, this surely must be it. Anyway, I thought it was very poignant mm. that that recollection of yours in that space, because there was a remarkable sense and mm. spirit almost of place yes. within that. And I'm sure the acoustics were part of it, because yes, it was so dry. Yeah. You yeah. could hear any sound. It was a remarkable place, and so well preserved. I think because mm. because of the lack of humidity. So, what happens when the sea ice melts is that it allows animals to come into this place, this great white silence, and transform it, as we've seen on, on Blue Planet 2, those astonishing images, particularly of these animals, orca, which we were on a couple of weeks ago, who are, um, you know, I don't anthropomorphize usually about animals, but if I've got a favorite animal, it's the orca, highly intelligent animals that have free reign over 70% of the planet. You know, I quite often think we're, we think we're the smartest, you know, that we, we evolved in the oceans like orca. Orca then decided to go back into the oceans and they now live in these sophisticated family groups, highly intelligent, communicate with echolocation and acoustic communication. We stay up here on the dry bits paying 20% VAT. Um, <laughs> These animals have free reign over the rest of the planet. I mean, who's the smartest? And when I... The great thing for me was to stand on the sea ice... I can get there. Um, several kilometres out to sea, taken there courtesy of the United States Science Foundation, and put my hydrophones into the sea. It's the sea here, was the helicopter pilot was telling me, was... 800 meters deep and we were on three meters of sea ice a long way from from the island but putting my hydrophones into that um, crack in the sea ice and tuning in to what was happening underneath was this fantastic contrast for me between the so-called great white silence and what was happening in the seawater where sound travels almost five times faster And then, in terms of time, we went here to the North Pole within a few months, maybe four months, and we were taken there from the Russian camp Barneo in, I think, what is the most dangerous trip we've ever undertaken um, in an ex-Russian military Soviet helicopter, <laughs> an MI-8 from 89 degrees north to 90 degrees north, the last 60 nautical miles, in something that resembled a second-hand washing machine shop <laughs> with, with rotor blades. <laughs> I remember when we landed, they had, because they can't use radar, because it goes straight through the ice. And of course, unlike Antarctica, th th this is the ocean. It's the, the North Polar ice cap, which is the frozen ocean revolving around... Um, the middle. And David went there to do a piece, again, a powerful piece about it's imagined that within 50 to 100 years, for the first time in history, there'll be open water at this place, um, at the North Pole. So we had to, we were taken there in this Russian helicopter, and I always remember the winchman, whoever he was, had a, an old tyre from the helicopter on a piece of rope, 
that they had no other means of measuring the altitude when we were up there. And they threw this tire out and, and he watched it till it bounced. And then he shouted, it was smoking as well, he shouted instructions to the pilot. And we then got dropped at the North Pole. At which point the producer said the usual thing. He said, all oh, right, David, Chris and um, Alistair were with, with us as well. He said, we need to get some shots of the... Um, she, she said, we need to get some shots of the empty North Pole, so you'll just have to go and hide somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to walk off and hide behind one of these spindrift frozen waves <laughs> while they filmed us. And I remember the conversation at that point because I had a GPS that, that uh, I'd said at one point 90 degrees north, but of course we were moving all the time with the polar current and we started to sort of twist it and move away. And I, I well remember this conversation because we were just, like I said at the start, we were just standing there waiting to be told, you know, what to do by, by the, the rest of the camera crew. And, you know, I said something like, look, if I look over there, it, it's to Los Angeles and we know people in Los Angeles, and then I can do this and look down to where Maggie is, where she, my wife, where she is now, down somewhere in Europe, and I can do this and look over to Asia and Australia, where we've got friends, you know, all in different time zones. The place where we were standing, every time zone on the planet converged. So what, what time was it? No, it was <laughs> It's a place where there's no time. I mean, it was, again, a powerful moment for me. There's one sunrise, isn't there? One sunset a year. Um, and in terms of time uh, and the aspect of this conversation, deep time, going to a place where, of course, I think we adopted either, I don't know if it was Norwegian time or Russian time we adopted, but, but that was it for the period. You can just choose your time and one sunrise and one sunset. And from that, from the silence of the North Pole, or the quietness, we then moved to a place where there was some open water, and I did the same thing. I put my hydrophones below the surface and recorded what I still regard, again, you know, in anthropomorphic terms, as the most beautiful animal music that I've ever heard. And these are bearded seals singing under the Arctic sea ice. But because... They have little holes where they come up to breathe through, but because there's no wave action on the surface, it sounds like they're in a room, um, which they are in to some aspects, they're under the surface of the ocean, but, but with no wave action on the top. And these are the songs that they've been singing for thousands, tens of thousands of years in that place. <laughs> Pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening. Before we go, before we go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll say we've got to go now. I'm going to put, I'm putting you on the spot. Chris, of course, uh, has a particular interest and he thinks that all the rest of us team are uh, insensitive, really, to sound. I mean, we listen to it, but you don't understand it in the way that he understands it. And on one evening, as we were sitting there drinking beer and so on, he actually said to me, you don't listen to the sounds. You don't think about them. You know? If you thought more about them, you would actually understand more. Now, for example, he said, I can tell the difference between a recording of waves on the shore in the Atlantic and waves on the shore in the Pacific entirely by listening to the recordings. Now, Chris, are you going to sit there and say that's true? Of course I am, yeah. In fact, I, I remember I made a CD for you. <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> well, it has a, the Pacific surf has this silky, sort of velvety, <laughs> growling sound, whereas the Atlantic is much harder and, and sharper. I mean, yeah. I'm sure lots of people know. There you are. <laughs> 
But anyway, so I made, I made somewhere in David's huge archive of recordings, there's a CD I made for him of the sounds of the Pacific and the Atlantic. That's his, that's his story. And, uh, and it's lasted us over many, many a beer and a <laughs> many a long time. Well, let's continue the debate over a drink this evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. <laughs> so much Chris and David an extraordinary journey through stories memories tales sounds images of a world that uh, we can only really appreciate because of such ventures and such uh, uh, activities as David and Chris have undertaken over many decades a wonderful beautifully shaped journey through the natural world uh, that we all depend on which we must defend of course with all the energies we have uh, I'm going to close things formally very shortly delighted that um, while we've been in the room here of course uh, Manchester Paul and Wakefield Public Libraries have been joining us uh, via the streaming live that's been going on in the room and the streaming film will be available to everyone from Wednesday morning so do please uh, make note of that and come back to the British Library website from Wednesday if you'd like to share this wonderful event with uh, friends, family and beyond. Um, but before we uh, come to a formal close I'm delighted to welcome the composer of Long Player, Jem Finer, to make a short presentation. Thank you. <laughs> We, we couldn't top that wonderful presentation. No, we couldn't. Well, Jen. gentlemen, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of myself and everyone, it's amazing, inspiring, beautiful. And uh, shall I start again? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I was just saying, um, on behalf of myself, the Long Perth Trust, and everyone, um, thank you very, very much for the most inspiring beautiful, wonderful talk. Um, it's a shame it couldn't go on longer. <laughs> we could have listened for ages. Um, custom, custom airily, we thank our conversationalists by giving um, an inscribed singing bowl. Wow. Yeah, um, how fantastic. You each. There's one for, one for you. Thanks, James. Chris. And one for you, Sir David. Oh, thank wow. you. And with those, you'll need... Um, <clears throat> A, a beater. <laughs> they all have. They they, they have their own very what specific beater. Oh well. There you go. Um, oh look at that. You know That's different. <laughs> uh, you, you you should run it round the outside. Oh the outside. Yeah. Or or you can um, just clang them like a bell. Uh, and if you want to use your mouth to modulate. Yeah it, yeah. If you hold it sort of. Um, so the sound, the sound of them comes out of the, yeah. the sound comes out of the side of them. Oh wow! So oh, you hold so it up to your mouth. I think I'll do that later in the privacy yeah. of yeah. my <laughs> hotel room. But anyway, um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much, Jem. Sorry to put you on the spot there, but I think it was very, very hard to, to add anything to that wonderful presentation. We could all have listened, of course, for a, at least a thousand years. Sadly, we have considerably less time than that. Please do um, track down uh, uh, the Long Player story, if you like, at longplayer.org, where you can uh, listen online, you can listen on an app, you can go to Trinity by Wharf in the London Docklands and listen to it live. You can listen to previous conversations, read about previous events and so on at longplayer.org. <coughs> cards on your seats will enable you, if you would like to, to con continue supporting Long Player uh, actively, as you must also do, of course, with the British Library, with Save Our Sounds particularly, but with the whole British Library project. Please do sign up, join, become a member of the library, and 
preserve the extraordinary repository of world knowledge here for future generations, as this whole evening, of course, has been uh, about. Uh, many, many thanks to everyone here for making it possible, of course, the Long Player Trust and everyone at the British Library. Please uh, continue to follow Chris Watson's work at his own eponymous website. You know where to find David's films. It's been an extraordinary evening, of course, a celebration of the natural world as we find ourselves in it, and a call, of course, a great plea to defend it in whatever way we can. So please do... Join me in giving your warmest thanks for their wonderful life and work and their, the worlds of wonder they have brought us on screen, uh, via the microphone, and of course, most of all in person tonight, Chris Watson and David Attenborough. Thank you very much. Thank you.